Bibles, please, and turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 8. John, chapter 8. Our focus will be on verses 52 through 59. I'll begin our reading at verse 48 as the background, you understand, is where they're having really a pretty good-sized argument over the truthfulness of our Lord's message. And in verse 48, the Jews answered and said to him, Do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. But I do not seek my glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died and the prophets also. And you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste of death. Surely you are not greater than our father Abraham who died. The prophets died too. Whom do you make yourself out to be? And Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, and of whom you say he is our God. And you have not come to know him, but I know him. And if I say that I do not know him, I will be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. And your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Therefore they picked up stones to throw at him, and Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. I was given this I have this one person who's really very nice. When she's through with her magazine, she gives it to me, and that's one I don't have to subscribe to get. I just get it. And the artic one of the articles in the magazine was what we really need, and it's by my re recollection, what we really need is not more education and not more of this, that, or the other. What we need is more courage. And you can see that Jesus Christ, if we're going to follow Christ, you're going to have to have some courage because Jesus Christ says, before Abraham was, I am. And if we, were, if we grew up as good Jews, we understood what Jesus just said. He claimed to be the I am of the book of Exodus when he was talking to Moses. And you and I need to have courage. We need to have courage today. I remember one time when I was in college, I came home for summer and I was working at Samsonite Luggage and we had this one guy who was probably one of the strongest, most outspoken atheists I'd ever seen. And we were sitting on the luggage because it was a slow day packing the freight cars. And he says, tell me about this Jesus. And I thought, oh, the Lord has answered my prayer. I'm going to tell him about Jesus. And we got down to business. And he says, oh, really? Is that how it is? And he went on. And I thought, the Holy Spirit has just set him up fine. I'm going to carry it home. And so I went, went at it, all I was worth, and I just had the gift of evangelism. I knew it, and this was going to break forth into some kind of a great renewal in the shipping department of Samsonite luggage. Just think, Samson and Goliath. I was really just on fire for that. Well, we had coffee break time at around 10 o'clock, and so we all went up to the cafeteria, and he was sitting there, and just about everybody in the shipping department was there and he says do you know what oh bud Furwood jr believes in jesus do you know and he started telling everything i said to him but he did it with such a scoffing tone i thought "Ooh, what have i done you need courage if you're going to be a christian you need courage if you're going to stand out and have people look at you and me and us and say there is the glory of christ resident in that person's soul Jesus set it up so that that's the only thing that we're going to do, that's the only thing that we can do if we're going to be followers of Christ. And it seems like Jesus has made it pretty clear. You don't take the gift of salvation and not live it and tell the story. And notice that Jesus Christ affirms himself to be the I am of the burning bush. 
what a claim. And you and I either have to take it or leave it. If we take it, we, have, we take Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. If we leave it, why go to church? But notice that Jesus' claim was, first of all, very clearly spoken and understood. And from a practical intent, when we live our lives for Jesus Christ, we should be very clear and outspoken and be quite understanding as we set out our word and have it clearly spoken so it can be understood. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. I just love the way that word was put together. Notice the, the emphasis of it all. Truly, truly, here it is. There's the truth, there is no more. Go no farther, it's right here. Take it, take it. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Make no mistake about it. They knew their theology and their Bible well enough to know what Jesus Christ was saying. He put himself out on the limb, and he expects us to put ourselves out on the limb, and he expects us to trust in him as he basically was trusting the truth of what he had to say. And notice that he already existed before Abraham was born. That's what he's saying. Before Abraham was born, I was already making my way around through the universe, if you don't mind me saying as much. And notice that the claim amounted to having eternal life, and perhaps more precisely, theologically speaking, being life eternal. Because in the end, we find life nowhere except in Christ. So we can make the statement that the claim amounted to eternal existence, but more so, the claim basically had embedded in there that he was the life. He would say later on, I am the resurrection and the life. He not only has the power to raise the dead, but he has the power to keep life going through that otherwise mortal body. This is who our Jesus is. And so it was indeed a claim to deity. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Therefore they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out to the temple. This is the way the story goes throughout history, that when we speak with the boldness of Christ, and if we tell the message of Jesus Christ, you may as well expect the kind of attitude that would lead people to pick up the stones and start throwing them your way. That's the way it goes in the life of Christ, I admit that in the United States, the most that we get anymore is perhaps scoffing and laughter. But we have brothers and sisters in China, we have them in India, we have them in other parts of the globe where to say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and he is the Lord of, of my life. That is enough right there to, be, to warrant the death sentence. And he was claiming to be God. And notice their response was, there's one nice thing about it. There's no if, and, or but about this. They knew what he said. They disagreed with what he had to say. And they made uh, basically an evaluation that he no longer deserved to live. Notice that thoughts do count. Attitudes count. Conduct counts. And it's not just a matter of, oh, well, dummies will be dummies. Notice that there's some dumbness that doesn't deserve to have a place on the face of the earth. And that dumbness, unless the Spirit of God is at work, is the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And so they picked up the stones. They understood his claim. They were taking action against a heretic because heresy was a capital crime. And it is many places now, and it doesn't have to have anything to do with supporting the faith, it has everything to do with getting rid of the faith. So Jesus' claim was clearly spoken and it was understood. Secondly, let's look at the essence of the claim a little more closely. In verse 58, Jesus said to them, truly, truly I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. And so we emphasize this, that this is a claim to be God. This is not a claim just to be a great theologian. This is not a claim to be a great historian of, of the faith. This is a claim for deity. And this is the one thing that you and I as Christians need to keep in our minds and in our thoughts always. Jesus Christ claimed to be God. 
There is the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Jesus clearly claims that he has a place in that relationship with his Father and with the Holy Spirit. It's a claim to be God, and it's a claim to life that is extraordinary. And because it is extraordinary, we stand in a line by virtue of faith where that extraordinary life belongs to you and to me. How should I put it? If you take a look at the future, do you see brightness or do you see bleakness? Do you see a bright street or a bleak street? And if you do see one that is bleak, what do you have to remedy the situation? If you see it as bright, what have you done to make sure that the situation is remedied? Notice that the whole difference is Jesus Christ. If a person has Christ, he has a bright future ahead. He knows that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He knows that the day will come when we all will be gathered together as the family of God in the per because of Jesus Christ. And it's either bleak or it's bright. There's no other way. And so we can do like what the psalmist says, those who are really unbelievers get everything to together and give it to their children and they pass on into the darkness of history. Or else we have the faith in the living God where we can say goodbye for a little while, but hello forever. He claims to be the source of life for others. For in verse 40, 40, 51, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. We can be touched by death physically, but not by the death that keeps us separated from who the one who is truly the source of life and that is Jesus Christ, life everlasting and life abundant. And this is what we have for ourselves. I, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. We'll, we will be touched by death physically perhaps, but only temporarily. This is what we have, and this is our story. This is our song. Notice there is a similar claim in the book of Revelation. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come. I am, I was. I am, I will be. I always am. This is the great story. I like it because, well, they play a great game with the language. They take a verb and turn it into a noun. Who, do you, who sent, sent me? Tell them I am sent you. There it is, a verb being used as a noun. Oh, I wish I could have gotten away with that in some of my English classes years ago. But I tell you, those teachers, they were something else again. But this is something else again all by itself. And he says, I am the Omega, the one who is. He's the one who is in the Garden of Eden. He's the one who is standing at the Jordan. He's the one who is standing at the gates of heaven. No matter what, he is. I am and I will always be. And the one who was, we can look back and see Moses, we can see Adam and Eve, we can see Noah, and we will see him who is. And he was only from a historical perspective, but as things change, he does not. He remains the same. And he is the one to come, the Almighty. This is the essence of the claim, and it is one of deity. And as we look forward to this season where it will conclude with the Resurrection Sunday, let's keep in mind that we are looking at no strange event. We are looking at an event that was a part of history before history began to be played out when the Lord said, let there be light. Notice the threefold claim is examined. In John 1, 1 through 2, in the beginning was the word. The Word was with God, the Word was God, and He was in the beginning with God. Notice the I am of prehistory. He was there prior to creation. He existed as God. In the beginning was the Word. If I could draw a line, I'd say, here's the line. To this side of the line, there's nothing but God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. On this side of the line is all of creation. 
there, right at the line, who is standing right at the line? None other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the beginning, the word already was. We look at the line and we go this way to, tra to trace out creation and everything that happens in terms of history. But we go back to that line and we go this way and all we see is the presence of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Never any change. The, he, he makes the changes, they make the changes, but they are not changed. And this is who we have. And so let's never forget it when we look at John 1, 1, 2, and even 3. Notice in Colossians 1, 16. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Notice what creation is all about here. It is not just about the physical universe. It's not just about the globe. It's not just about the planets and the stars and the moon. It's more than just the matter. Notice that he is also the creator of social structures and has laid the foundation for cultures, the way they should be and the way that they ultimately will be standing before Christ one day. The creation is for the purpose of the Lord. Notice, all things have been created through him and notice for him. When we take a look at how history is going, we finally say this is going the way the Lord wants it and this is for him. And that's what we must never forget, that he is in control. The Lord is in his heavens, is he not? And he does as he pleases. And he has a purpose. He has a purpose for you, for me, for this church. And he has a purpose for what's going on in Europe. And therefore we feel, and properly so, somewhat secure that no matter what happens, it will ultimately end up for the blessing of the Lord's people and to the honor and glory of Jesus Christ, as well as the Father. He is before all things in Colossians 1.17, and in him all things hold together. Notice he was not only the creator, but he also was and is the sustainer. Notice that he was before all things, and in him all things hold together. I love so much to read some of these things about creation and about evolution, and I get laughed at because there's a creator. There's something in my mind that says that wherever there is an effect, there must be a cause. And because I believe that Jesus Christ is the cause of what we see going on, and so with the Father and the Son, and I believe that, I'm a dumb blind man. I've been dumbed by this business of faith. But I'm telling you, and I'll tell you to my grave, that when you find a scientist who is a total sectarian and a total materialist, he has to make a leap of faith so great, mine looks like I'm walking just a little bit, just pitter-pat, pitter-pat. That is an act of faith on their part that does not have a proper object of trust and faith. And we have that, and he is before everything, and it's in him that all things hold together. When we step out and we see how things work in terms of night and day, winter and summer, the way societies work, that this is basically taking place with the care and the support of Jesus Christ. And as he offers care and support, the day will come when the question will be asked of all of us, what have you done with the care and the support that I have given to you? What have you done with Jesus Christ? Notice as well, the I am of the prehistory was also the great I of history. And the I am of prehistory is of the current events and thus history itself. Notice in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. In these last days, God the Father has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. I want us to look at this particularly well, let's take it from the top. God has spoken to us in and through the person of Jesus Christ. As far as things go these days, I have a rather specious understanding of somebody who will go on TV or write a book and claims that he's got a special gift and he can predict this, that, and the other thing. 
my first question is that when I see that kind of stuff, I ask the question, and where is Jesus Christ in your system of interpretation? If Jesus Christ is left out, that should be looked at askance, whatever is being said. And I'll say that anytime, any place, and if I've offended you, I'm sorry, but I would like to hear a counter-argument. In these last days, the God the Father has spoken to us in his Son, and notice the authority that the Son has, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the world. Stop and underscore that term world, if you will, because what it is actually translated, can be translated as, he has created the, the flow of the epics of, of history, because it speaks of periods of time. He is the creator of time where history plays out whatever is going to be played out at that particular period in human history. The I am, the one who is, gives purpose to history. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. When we take a look sometimes at what is being said about our universe and what it's made out of, and there is no such thing as purpose, we're free to create our own purpose. Not so for you and me as Christians. We are here to live to the honor and to the glory of God. This is our purpose, and this is what we should be doing as we live out our lives. And this is our calling above all else. All right. He takes possession of the title deed. Notice in Revelation chapter 5, verse 7, we see that heavenly scene. And all of a sudden, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, came out and went over to the throne and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Jesus Christ has the title deed to all that is created. He has the title deed twice over, once as creator and second as redeemer. And when he steps out, he was the only one qualified to take possession of the title deed of the universe and all that is created. This is our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The I am who was and is also is the coming one. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Notice that the Heavenly Father has ceased overlooking the ignorance of men as we, try, as we move ahead. Therefore, in Acts chapter 17, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Notice everyone everywhere is to, is to repent. That sticks people very badly, very, very badly for two reasons. One, to repent, you have to admit that you're wrong. Number two, when you repent, you have to concede that there is someone else who has authority over you. And those are the two things that always bug a person when you're sharing the gospel. It might bug them tremendously or lightly, but usually the question is always there. Why should I have to repent? After all, I am free to live and to do what I want. Notice that the idea of repenting basically challenges their authority and their freedom. And number two, they have to admit they're wrong. The Heavenly Father has ceased overlooking the ignorance of men and women everywhere. And in these last days, he's declaring all people everywhere to repent. And he has fixed a day in which the world will be judged. The time is set. The calendar is pointing in that direction. And the day will come when every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is the Lord of all. And notice he's appointed the one who is, who was, and who is to come to judge in righteousness. And we, we need not, we better not overlook that. And what I see each period of church history usually has some attributes and characteristics that basically will define them for all the historians. For example, when we speak of the Middle Ages, we speak of churches being structured in such a way. When we speak of the Reformation, we speak of the changes that have taken place. And what is, what is seen a lot in our times and the things that I read, so much of church life 
has basically got to be church entertainment. If you and I were in U Ukraine today, would we like to watch some cartoon about Jesus Christ, or would we like to be sure that we've got our understanding of the Word of God correctly? Because we may not have the day to get things straight. It's got to be straight here and now. So notice, this much is for us, I think. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's heart. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. As we take a look at everything that we can in this period of time, there are those who claim that God has given them a special gift of discernment that enables them to judge others. This is wrong. This is just not right in any way. They are to be confronted when they're sin, but to basically assess the value of their lives as God would do, that is a real no-no, and they're wrong to do so. But notice there are those who refuse to judge themselves at all, and this too is wrong, because we're not talking about judgment in, turning of, in terms of assessing some type of everlasting value. We're talking about having your system checked out every now and then, as you would a car. You have enough air in the tires, is it time to change the oil? In my case, the answer is no on the first and yes on the second. And I gotta get to it this week, so remind me if you will. Notice that what is necessary is this, that without condemning ourselves, we examine ourselves with a view to conforming to the will of God and thus grow in grace. And we can then look forward to the Lord's return when he will offer praise to each of his servants. In some of my Christian walk along the way, what I have found is I've come across some people who can be very critical about you just because they think they've got the gift. But what I like came to me at a time that was a special blessing. Notice, let's read this again. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes and he will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness, and he will disclose the motives of men's hearts. And here's the encouraging word. And this is the part in the thinking that is left off sometimes. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. Every person in this room who has de declared Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior has this guarantee from God's word that no matter how we've messed up along the line, when we stand before the Lord, there's been enough of his grace and his love working in our lives so much so that we will receive praise from him when we stand before him. There's not a person in this room who has confessed Jesus as Lord and Savior who's going to be blanked out on Judgment Day. After all is said and done, that person will sit there or stand there or be on their knees and will hear Jesus Christ say, well done, you good and faithful servant. And I trust that each here this day can say, I know Jesus is my Savior, and my hope is I will hear from him. Well done, you good and faithful servant. Our Father, as we come to you in prayer, we ask that you would give to us a proper sense of responsibility and service. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy through all the things that we have to go through in life, things that are hard, things that are easy, things that are joyful, things that are not. May we remain faithful to serving you and following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen.